Okay. So, welcome to this today's class. Um, we are going to wrap up some of the support vector classification, and then we'll look at a few other places where you can use support vectors, and we'll probably get to maybe regression and novelty detection today. <coughs> and on Wednesday, we'll cover some of the issues in terms of, you know, which kernel should you use, and what does it actually mean to have the right kernel, how can you do things rapidly if you have very high dimensional spaces. So we'll get to a couple of more fun things there. Okay, so um, first of all, um, yes, I heard the comments about the homeworks loud and clearly. Uh, the comments were something along the lines of there was probably a bit much homework, and also that the level of difficulty was fairly uniform. And some people told me that they were, the homework was hard. Some people told me it was fairly easy but very tedious. Um, so we will change it insofar as you will find probably easier and harder pieces of homework for the next homework. And overall, it will be a bit less. But then on the other hand, you will probably find some problems that you'll be well, having fun with and that they that will pose more of a challenge. Okay, so this is just to, uh, as a heads up, so yes, we do hear that feedback and many thanks for giving that. So the guys who sent posted those comments on the forum, that's much appreciated. By the way, if there's a silent majority that disagrees with that assessment, uh, you need to become a vocal majority and actually post such comments on the forum. Otherwise, we're just going with, you know, the people who post comments and get and, you know, tell us things. So I think we'll get the level right as we go along. Um, <coughs> were there any questions from last week? Everything clear, everything totally understood, right? Okay, good. So now we're going to switch to nonlinear binary classification. And this is sort of the simplest, non-trivial, pretty much state-of-the-art classifier. So even after about 15 years that this was uh, invented, it's still one of the better methods that you can use. Yes, you can tweak it, and there are hundreds of papers of tweaks. But by and large, the basic idea hasn't changed rather so dramatically. So let's just briefly remember the, well, separation with margins that we did last time, right? So we said, well, minimize one half norm of W squared. So that ensure that we got a large margin. And then under the condition that we actually separate all of the observations with a large margin. So W dot XI plus B times YI greater or equal than one. And then we said, well, actually, it's not quite clear whether this is really always possible. So let us use something where we have slack variables. In other words, we weaken those constraints by adding minus psi i into the constraints. And correspondingly, we added c times psi i into the objective. Now remember what this did was, if you make c really, really large, it'll pretty much make it next to unaffordable to actually incur any violation of the constraint. So only those really, really terribly violated observations would actually you know, be taken into account. Whereas if C is very small, then every observation that's not quite so easily classified might lead to a constraint violation. And <clears throat> in the dual problem, what we then got is, well, we got the original SVM problem back with the additional upper bound on the alpha i's. <coughs> so if you look at it, you saw that we had alpha i being, being between 0 and c. And what you can easily infer from that is also the following. Suppose I solved the problem with c being infinity, so the original hard margin problem. Then there has to be a largest value of c, uh, of all the alpha i's. So if c is greater or equal than that largest value, well, the hard and the soft margin solution are actually identical. And as you keep on decreasing C, more and more and more of those upper bounds become active. 
thus limiting the influence of those observations, thus put, pushing those points which were on the margin over into, well, you know, the, the place where the inner product is maybe zero and then possibly to the wrong side. And we saw that a little bit for the linear observations and we'll see some more in the nonlinear case in a few slides. So this will become a little bit more clear. Now, the nice thing about the dual problem was that you could write it also entirely in terms of inner products. So the xi's and xj's only occurred in terms of xi dot xj. This is something that we already saw in the case of the perceptron, and now we're seeing it again. And then finally, the support vector expansion looked exactly like our perceptron expansion, with the only difference being that now we have weights, alpha i, up front, whereas for the perceptron, basically every observation that was wrong, you know, had just a weight of one. So that was the main difference, that now we can be a little bit more subtle about how much we weigh observations, whereas before, well, whenever we make a mistake, boom, okay, you just pay for it. So how would you go and kernelize this without looking at the slides that you've maybe already downloaded? Well, I think it's kind of easy, right? I mean, I've already marked it up, right? You look at all the yellow bits and you replace them by a kernel. Boom, right? Very easy. Now, the thing that, so this transformation is very easy, right? This took decades for people to realize. And so one paper was essentially just that query replace. And it's one of the more cited, better cited papers in computer science. So now we understand how we can do support vectors. So the only difference is really that now we have those kernel functions. So whereas before you had a possibly very computationally efficient expansion, now you need to sum over all those kernel functions. And we'll actually revisit that at a later stage. But for you know, thousands of observations, not tens of thousands, but for thousands of observations, it's actually pretty good. So let's see what happens. Well, we take the same data set as before, and well, we crank up C. And you can see that nothing happens, right? By the way, what you're seeing here is the straight line is the decision boundary. And those circles here are the margins at minus 1 and plus 1, respectively. So bear in mind that straight lines in this high dimensional feature space need not correspond to straight lines or even lines at all in the original space. They can correspond to circles. They can correspond to all sorts of bizarre objects. More on that bizarre objects later. But what you can also see is that the support vectors, the ones at the boundary, are now not necessarily the ones that are closest to the blue guys, but actually also some of them to the side. Because the geometry in this high dimensional space is just very weird and very different. You can also see that nothing happens because the solution had the largest value of alpha less than, in this case, 50 or 100. So increasing the upper constraint does not change the problem. Okay. Now, as we get something a bit noisier, well, things change. I mean, if you squint at it, you can see that it changed a little bit. So basically, there were some points that were a little bit beyond the margin, and now they're exactly on the margin, and now you shouldn't see any difference. But you see a similar effect, right? For this noisier data set, well, here you can actually see a whole bunch of points being, well, in this case, this one's actually misclassified. These are on the margin, sorry, beyond the margin. These two guys are on the margin, and clearly you don't see any of the red guys inside here being support vectors, fitted for the blue ones. And so as we increase C, well, what you're going to see is that the size of the width of the margin here actually decreases, and we're cleaning it up. Right? And so now you have actually a nice nonlinear separation. And here the points are exact in the margin, and between this and that, you should not see any difference because now we fit all the constraints. Okay. If it gets noisy and we increase the upper constraint, you can see more and more and more 
and more degenerate solutions, right? So this is probably a situation where that, that is not a good solution for the estimation problem. It looks worse on the picture than it actually is because if you think about it, the major separator is this guy here, right? And then, okay, it does something weird here where no data occurs and, well, it's not quite sure in here. But it's not as crazy bad as you would think. So in terms of, you know, classification error, this is going to be not stellar, but not really horrible. So what's to do? Well, one thing is simply you impose a tighter constraint, right? So you do something like this. Or you could also pick a, well, let's see what happens with a narrow kernel. You'll see that things go even more crazy. So let's try the opposite. Let's pick a really wide kernel. And you can see that the wide kernel also fixes it. So you basically have two knobs. You have one for, let's say, a Gaussian RBF kernel, which is the width of the kernel. And you have one, which is the <coughs> regularization constant. And those two things do similar things, but they don't do quite the same. So let me give you a bit of an idea of how you might actually want to set the kernel width. So, Suppose we have a Gaussian RBF kernel. So, by the way, thanks for giving me that paper. Uh, so that kernel looks something like that. E to the minus one over two sigma squared, normal x minus x prime squared, right? And so what happens is if you have two points, and let's say they're you know, in the order of sigma apart, then this entire expression will be something like order one. If I have another point that's really <coughs> far apart, then, well, that entire expression will be much larger than one, so this will be close to zero, right? So what you're controlling effectively with that kernel width, right? So you basically have such a kernel, or you have something that's super peaked, you're controlling which points are still considered similar to each other. And so by picking a kernel that's super wide, you're basically saying everything's similar. Whereas picking something that's very narrow, you're saying, well, most observations are only similar to themselves. And you don't want to have really either of those things. You don't want to have the situation where everything is similar to everything. Because then you will clearly oversmooth. You also want to avoid where everything is only similar to itself, because then it doesn't really generalize nicely. It lower fit. So here's a very simple trick that you can use, and that pretty much gets the, the job done for RBF kernels. You basically want this quantity and that quantity here to be of the same order of magnitude. So you just draw random pairs, xi, xj, compute their square difference. So you, you basically draw one, maybe a thousand pairs randomly. So don't draw a hundred points and then compute all square pairs, at all square distances. Compute 1,000 random pairs and compute their square distances. And you get some histogram, right? So here's the square distance. And here's zero, here's one and you'll get something that will probably look like so, right? And so if you squint at it, you can see that maybe, you know, maybe this is the 5% quantile and it's the 95% quantile here. Scale. That somewhere in this range is where you want to get your sigma squared. Because this will ensure that, you know, not all the points are similar, but also that not none of the points are similar. And the good strategy is you essentially compute the values of, of that square distance at the 5%, 10%, 50%, 
and 90, and maybe if you're crazy, also 95% quantile. And now you have five values to cross-validate over. This is quite affordable. And you'll pretty much get the kernel width right. Yes? Yes. So the question was, what if I change C, does the number of support vectors change? Okay. Actually, we can work that out directly, right? Because what we had is that C posed an upper constraint on the Lagrange multipliers. So if I decrease C, each individual point cannot push that hard anymore. So what happens is that, therefore, additional points will get recruited because the margin gets larger, so more points get drawn in. The effect is that the number of support vectors will increase as you decrease C. However, if you have a very noisy problem, then if you increase C you know, to very high values, and knowing that some of those kernels like this one here effectively have an infinite dimensionality, you're going to get a situation where the number of support vectors is still not going to decrease a lot, but you're just going to overfit a lot and you're basically going to fit to the noise. So you can control the number of support vectors only to a small extent by adjusting C. Um, usually if you have a you know, constant fraction of points being support vectors, that actually gives you a good idea of you know, what you know, test error you should expect at least. At least, you know, point, wrong, points on the wrong side of the margin are likely to be also wrong anyway. But number of support vectors is a reasonable indication for how easy the problem is. You can go into a lot more detail and get good learning theory bounds but we might not have enough time to do that in detail. Uh, we'll look at slightly different bounds. One thing also to notice is that, of course, by decreasing C, by making this constraint tighter, you're making the problem more robust because now one wrong point cannot mess up the entire solution quite as much anymore. Any other questions? That was a good question. Thanks. Good. Um, so, in other words, increasing C gives us more nonlinear solutions. Decreasing, well, it will decrease the number of errors in the training set, but not necessarily in the test set. And as we also saw, well, the separation boundary need not be contiguous. Now, the kernel adjusts the function class, and this is exactly where I said, well, this will give you a reasonably good estimate of the kernel width. And so then you only need to cross-validate over maybe five different values. If you're very much pressed for CPU time, you can leave the 10 and 90% quantiles out. This is an approximation, and what you would actually expect is that as the sample size goes to infinity, you're going to go and pick narrower and narrower quantiles. It's a similar reasoning to what you would do with k-nearest neighbors. But for all practical cases where you would use kernels directly, this is just good enough. So just in case you're a theorist and you get, a, <coughs> get mad at me for claiming this, yeah, this is with a small grain of salt. Okay. Good. Now let's move to risk and loss. So, because so far, I mean, those SVMs looked kind of weird, right? I mean, this is like a fully geometric approach and then we hacked some things together and, uh, yeah. Why does it actually work? And it looks kind of very different from what you would usually do if you wanted to classify, right? I mean, usually if you were to classify, you'd say, well, hey, I care actually about minimizing the number of errors. So here's our constraint quadratic program again. If you look at it, it's the problem that we have before. <coughs> and so if you think about it, actually, you can solve for psi i directly. Right? You can solve for psi i directly because if that constraint 
is perfectly satisfied, that term is zero anyway. And if it's not satisfied, you can work out the value of psi i, because it's always going to be the smallest possible value that for which this constraint holds. So in other words, it's then always going to be 1 minus yi w dot xi plus b. I mean, all you have to do is just move psi i to the left, move this to the right, and set it to equality, so you get this, right? <coughs> and so what we can do is we can take that constraint and put it into the objective function. The problem hasn't changed. The only reason why I wrote it before like this is because this was a quadratic program, so quadratic objective function with linear constraints, whereas now we have a convex program that, well, you can transform back into a quadratic program, but at first, well, we have some objective, we have some terms in the objective, objective function that are piecewise linear. And usually this is something your <coughs> optimization code can handle easily. This some codes can handle, some codes cannot handle so well. And the other thing is, that's the original formulation. This is what people realized afterwards. OK. <coughs> so in other words, we are actually trying to minimize you know, the norm of w squared, whatever that may mean. And in addition to that, we're trying to minimize that very weird function. Let's just plot that very weird function. So if we think about it, what it really means to get things right for classification. All we want is that y, dot f of, y times f of x is, well, greater than zero. If it's less, than, less equal than zero, well, we incur a loss. Now, that is not a quadratic, that's not a convex function. So you could start thinking, you know, which convex functions might be upper bounds? And this is, an up, this is a possible upper bound. Let me draw a few upper bounds for you. Because the specific functional form doesn't really matter that much. What matters more is just such that you get the idea. So remember, that was our step function. And here's, of course, the origin. This quantity y times f of x is sometimes also called the margin. Because that's basically how far it is away from the decision boundary in some unnormalized way. So this was clearly one thing that you could do. You could do something else. You could just draw a parabola, right? So in other words, you could do something like 1 minus y f of x, positive half of that squared. So this basically means max of the argument and 0. This is just a much less tedious way to write it out. Now, you could say, well, hey, I like the quadratic part because it's nicely you know, differentiable. Whereas otherwise, here I have derivatives which are all 0, and then they jump to you know, about 1. You could also do something as follows, where you have a constant term, then a quadratic term, and then it continues linearly. And that actually turns out to work also really well. So for instance, if you use walpole wabbit <laughs> W. So this is John Langford's code. He actually does that part. And on some data sets, he's found empirically that this works better on more cases than some of the others, but there's, it's not really a very strong evidence, but, well, there's some. It's not really any theoretical guarantees why, but all I'm trying to explain is that there is a whole bunch of different loss functions that you could use. You could also use a logistic. And we'll get to the logistic in, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. But it's basically going to be something of the form log of 1 plus e to the minus y times f of x. And 
we'll also then see why this is reasonable. So here are those different loss functions, right? That's exactly what I drew. And it's just now in beautiful explicit equations. Right? So that this, well, zero, then linear, and here in the middle it's quadratic. And the logistic, well, we'll see corresponds to basically an exponential, a conditional exponential family in the loss sum in, in that case. So this is another way how you can view this entire problem, right? And so now what you have is the, the issue of, well, you want to minimize the classification error. Well, you go and compute some empirical average. The problem is non-convex and, well, overfitting is bad, so you go and get a convex upper bound of the loss. You add some regularizable capacity control. So that's this part here. And then you solve the problem. That strategy of solving otherwise not so nice optimization problems by first getting a convex or otherwise well tractable bound on that loss, and then adding a penalty to keep the solution simple is very powerful. And you can use it not just for binary classification, but you can use it to annotate sequences, you can use it to recommend ads, you can use it for named entity recognition to annotate and segment swimmer activities. So you can do crazy things with that framework. And we'll be probably encountering some of those more crazier things as we go along, but this is a generic template, so if you have one of those optimization problems, have a go at it. Okay. Any questions about that so far? And while that all may sound fairly abstract, um, we'll get some examples as we go along now. No questions? Okay. Good. So then let's move on to the second block. So we'll do regression. <coughs> so that's exactly, we're picking up where we left off before. We want to find some function f that minimizes you know, some regression error. So the expected value of some loss under some distribution. And of course, we don't really have this guy. So we can, all we can do is just really compute the empirical average. And Banabash is going to deal with loss and risk and so on in a lot more detail. But it'll just start cropping up here informally for the next few slides, but don't be too scared if you're at the loss set following the loss. Okay, so what you do is you add regularization for capacity control as expected. Um, so let's look at an example of a loss. So you could have a squared loss. <coughs> this is something that we actually did in lecture one, right? But we had linear regression with a squared loss. And it's also quite related to our homework. So we basically had one half y minus f of x squared, and you want to minimize that and at the same time keep the function simple. Any questions at, at the moment? I guess this is not so scary, everybody's seen a parabola. Um, everybody's probably also seen the absolute value function. You can use that as a loss too. The difference is quite simply that, well, the L1 loss. If you look at the gradient, the gradient doesn't really care about how far you are wrong on either side. You keep on pushing the same mistake. Uh, then there's something very crazy. It's called the epsilon insensitive loss, uh, which I had the well, good or bad fortune, whatever, to uh, work on for my uh, basically undergrad project. Yeah, Bufnik had the idea that you would want to have the notion of a margin also for regression. So you'd basically have a linear loss if you exceeded the tolerance by epsilon, otherwise you didn't. Uh, while that may look completely crazy, in the financial industry, there are actually products that do that. So right, you're basically betting on your security not to exceed a certain lower and upper range. And if it does, then you, you, know, you basically pay the difference. So that's exactly that type of loss, by the way. Um, so it's not completely 
crazy. Or if you think about it, you know, maybe you're manufacturing screws and they need to fit certain tolerances and if, as long as they fit those tolerances, it's fine. If they are too small or too large, well, it's not good. So let's do the penalized least mean squares, right? <clears throat> this should look very familiar. And I'm going to do the derivation in a bit more detail on paper if you want. So, well, what do we have? Well, we have basically y minus xi dot w squared. I've left the b out just because I'm lazy. Um, now, if we take the derivative of this, well, it's actually fairly straightforward, right? We have, uh, who wants me to go through this in more detail than it's on the slide? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, okay, okay, good, derivation. <coughs> So what we have is a sum, 1 over 2m, sum over i going from 1 to m, y i minus w from x i squared. Plus, and then we have some lambda over 2 uh, w. So if you look at that expression, you can also write it as y minus x times w <coughs> norm squared. Right? I've basically just padded all those xi's together into one big fat matrix. So that matrix here has basically x1 spread out, x2 spread out, up to xn. matrix x and the y's are of course you know this column vector w is a column vector of the dimensionality d and so we get this plus lambda over 2 norm of w squared right. now if I take the derivative dw of x times w well that's just x easy. And now all I do is I just use the, the chain rule here, so I get 1 over m y minus x times w times x transpose plus lambda times w. And this has to vanish, right? So I get from that, and I can just now go and multiply m over here. So I get that y times x transpose. Uh, and sorry, I had a minus here again. Yeah. Okay, so I get y times x transpose equals. x, sorry, actually I have x times y transpose, x, x transpose, w plus <coughs> lambda m times w. So I can actually bracket that out. So I get x, x transpose plus lambda times m times the identity matrix times w. And then I just bring this to the left hand side. And I get W equals X, X transpose plus lambda M identity inverse X, Y transpose. Just a minor issue that it should be X transpose by minus. Uh, X, X, W. 
So that's a column vector, right? Yeah, I've, I've probably screwed up the transpose. <laughs> so. Okay, you, you can fix that on your own. And MATLAB will scream at you if you get it wrong. <laughs> or Octave. So this is, yeah. Um, basically, it fits one way and doesn't fit the other. So be careful of that. Um, <clears throat> now, a quick aside, when you, when you saw, but many thanks, Manabash, for pointing this out. I, I usually screw up there, so. <laughs> okay, um, now, a, as a quick aside, when you solve this problem here, okay, so this is going to be a D by D matrix. Do not go and do something like this. In of, you know, this beast here. And then you multiply by X, and then you multiply by Y. This is an extremely bad idea. Do not do that. So here's why this is a really bad idea. It's a really bad idea, especially for larger systems. I mean, you can do that to just check whether your code is okay, because it, this makes all the numerical instabilities come off. So it's a different problem whether you say, well, find, an, find me the solution of an optimization problem, where, uh, of, find me the solution of a problem <coughs> AX equals Y, find the solution X, or find the general solution for all possible x and y pairs, which would mean inverting a. Because in one case, the condition of a will actually come back and mess things up, whereas otherwise, your numerical linear algebra codes will actually take care of things. So MATLAB might makes it kind of hard to do this in a nice way, but if you can basically invoke a linear systems of equation solver, so, for instance, if you're using BLAST or LAPAC, it actually has um, the following routines, which may sound super arcane to you. Um, D, P, O, T, R, F, and D, P, O, T, R, S. Now, if you've never heard of BLAST and LAPAC, <coughs> These are linear algebra packages. Your computer actually has them already pre-compiled and heavily optimized for whatever processor. So if you have a Mac, this is called the Accelerate Framework. If you have Linux, you should do something like apt-get install Atlas. That will then make your computer run like crazy for about five hours and then you have a heavily tuned library for your processor and your memory chips and everything. So after you upgrade your memory, you want to rerun that. Now, these are function calls and they look super arcane because they came from Fortran and there, there was a limit on the number of characters that a function could have in its name. And D means double, so there's also an S version of that and a C and a Z, which is for complex and double complex. PO means positive semi-definite, TR means triangular, and F means factorization, S means solver. F means basically Kolesky decomposition in this case. And after you invoke that Kolesky decomposition, you then solve the linear system of equations. So if you ever have the good fortune of solving any of those problems at scale, remember that stuff. If you don't, you can just forget about what I said. But if you otherwise just use that in anger, most likely MATLAB will, will scream at you and tell you that the condition of the matrix is ill-behaved or something else. Okay. And so, for instance, in the example that I showed in the first lecture, MATLAB actually, well, in this case, Octet, told me, well, you're doing a stupid thing. Okay. Good. Any questions at this point? And let's do the entire thing with kernels. And so if you look at it, well, it basically looks like the very same optimization problem as what we have before, except that now rather than x, we have phi of x. And the reason why I'm going through that in a bit more detail is because it also introduces something called a representative theorem. So 
the representer theorem, which, so Grace Wava told me that was the only paper she submitted that was just accepted as is. And it was one of her first papers, so. Um, basically says that the solution of an optimization problem of that form has to have a form where basically W is given by a linear combination of the form of XIs. Okay, so let's look at that in a bit more detail. Here's what happens. We can decompose W, you know, our solution after all, into something that is parallel to, that's basically in the span of the phi of size, and something that is orthogonal to the phi of size. So basically, W is W parallel plus W orthogonal, and W parallel is in the span of the phi of x i and w orthogonal is in the orthogonal complement of that. Okay, so what that immediately implies is that w orthogonal dot phi of x i equals zero for all i. It also means that the norm of w squared is the norm of w parallel squared plus w orthogonal squared. Okay. So now if you look at the optimization problem, you can see that we have a left term which only depends on the w parallel part, this bit here. We have a second term which decomposes into the parallel and the orthogonal part. So that means we can solve for the parallel and the orthogonal part separately. Now what is the optimal solution if I minimize W orthogonal in this expression here? What should be the solution for W orthogonal? Zero. Exactly. So what that therefore means is that the optimal solution in W is in the span of those phi of size. In other words, what we have is that W is a linear combination sum over alpha i phi of x i. Now, we've gone through this for the case of here squared loss and a quadratic penalty. You can make that more general. You can say, well, any function that depends on w only in terms of function values phi of x i, right? And any penalty that depends on W only through its norm and is monotonic and it still holds. So that's a strict generalization of the representative theorem and well it's actually rather useful. As a rather sad side note in this context um, so this is a paper that we wrote a couple of years ago and we sent it to Colt and the proof is as you can see trivial. I mean, I just talked you through the proof of it. And so the referees came back, well, it's a really nice result, but the proof is so trivial, reject. <laughs> okay, we submitted it the following year, and we added something to it that was, well, non-trivial, looked intimidating, <laughs> and you would never use in practice. Paper accepted. <laughs> okay, so. I mean, yeah, we changed the writing a little bit, but at the end of the day, nobody cares about the non-trivial part of the paper, and everybody refers to it for the trivial part. So, uh, so don't be disheartened if your paper is, re is rejected because, well, the proof is too trivial. Okay, anyway. So what I just talked you through is this argument here. And now what we can do is we can solve this entire thing by, you know, just writing the entire optimization problem in terms of the expansion coefficients. Well, why is this good? Because now all of a sudden, an optimization problem which before may have happened in an infinite dimensional space is now reduced to a finite dimensional optimization problem. So that's the advantage of the representative theorem. That you don't really have to do all the bookkeeping in the infinite dimensional space. We know that the optimal solution is in some linear subspace 
and that's where all the action happens. So in other words, well, we have the optimization problem down here, and I'm going to just write out the solution for you again. Okay. So as before, we can write this problem as 1 over 2m, and here we have the norm of y minus, and well, that first term, ki, j, alpha, j, just comes from the fact that I have written w as a linear combination of alpha i, well, yeah, phi of xi, and kij is just k of xi and xj. Okay, so we have k times alpha, norm squared, plus lambda over 2 alpha transpose k alpha. Again, derivative with respect to alpha equals zero. And you might already be wondering why on earth do I always use a two up here? I just, it's just that because afterwards the derivatives look prettier. So we have one over n. And here we have <coughs> k times k alpha minus y plus lambda times k alpha. Question, why didn't I have to write k transposed here? Because it's a symmetric matrix, exactly. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to do something else that's a little bit sneaky. If this has to vanish, well, two things can happen. Well, this can be just, can have a non-trivial null space, or in which case, well, there's not much I can do anyway, because it automatically holds. Or that part here needs to be nicely solved, so, well, we can just throw this guy out here. I multiply by m, and I get that k alpha minus y plus lambda m times alpha equals zero. And from that, by just solving for y again, I get that y equals k plus lambda m times the identity matrix alpha. Then you solve. So that's exactly what we have before. So this problem will show up again later on under the guise of Gaussian process regression. And we'll get a very different interpretation of that. As a matter of fact, that very different interpretation is something that you were sort of already steered to in the homework, right? So I've probably given you a good hint for how to solve the homework, right? So I guess everybody is going to Google Gaussian process regression now. <laughs> um, anyway, if you haven't got the solution by now, this is probably okay. Um, the other thing is that this also comes under the guise of support vector regression with, with squared loss, or least squares support vector regression. So whenever somebody tells you about least square support vector regression, remember that, and remember that it's the same thing as Gaussian processes for regression, more or less. And we'll encounter the differences and how it relates later on, so don't worry. You may also encounter that under a very different name, called Krigging. So, I think this is also popular in Fran French, it's called Le Crigage in that case. And the thing is, this was a master's student in South Africa, I think 1941 or 43. And he came up with the idea for that as part of his master's thesis in South Africa. Unfortunately, nothing really spectacular became of him afterwards, but this is quite impressive. Okay. Something to aim for for your thesis, right? Um, and it's actually very popular in geostatistics. So whenever you hear, hear people talk about Krigging, remember it's the same thing as least square support vector machines. It's the same thing as Gaussian processes, more or less, and then there are also various spline-fitting methods of Grace-Waba, 
and they all do more or less the same thing and it just works, so go for it. Um, any questions here so far? Yep. Do we still have the sparsity of the kernel here? Um, do we have a sparsity of the kernel? Okay, so first of all, these types of solutions will not give you sparsity in the coefficients. Secondly, I don't think I ever introduced sparsity in the kernel, so, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a bit confused here. I mean, there are algorithms that will give you sparsity in one way or another. So there's, for instance, the relevance vector machine, which will do that. And that uses rather different reasonings for knocking out some coefficients. You can, in some cases, define sparsity in the kernel. Oh, so are you referring to our density estimation kernel? OK. So big warning. The kernel in density estimation has nothing to do with the kernels that we're using now. The kernels that we're using now should not be necessarily confused with the kernel for density estimation. So big warning, do not use. I mean, it should be kind of clear if you have a kernel of the form k of x and x prime is, you know, x dot x prime to the power of 3. Right. That's not a very good function for density estimation. <laughs> right. It'll just do something really crazy. Um, it's rather unfortunate that the word kernel is so popular in math that it's used for a lot of different things. You can also use it to define delta distributions, for instance, and also operating systems. And as I told you, I once got this application by this very unfortunate student. So um, be careful what you mean with kernels. Okay. Uh, now let's look at epsilon sensitive regression because we haven't seen a constrained quadratic program now for about 10 minutes. So let's encounter a new one. Um, so that's exactly the loss function that I showed you before. <coughs> And, well, we can just try solve the optimization problem. So, as you would expect, this will again lead to a constrained quadratic program. I'm not going to go in excruciating detail through exactly how you get to those various steps, but they're on the slide and you can always look them up if you're so inclined. But what you can see is that now each observation has, you know, the chance of screwing up by exceeding the value or also by being too small. Right. So you have those two parts. And each of them needs its own slack variable. Actually, you wouldn't need its own slack variable for each of them and their equivalent formulations if you don't have it. But it, it looks a little bit prettier if you do. And then in this case, well, we can write out the Lagrange function. And you crank the handle. So you take the derivative with respect to w with respect to b and with respect to all the size. So this is really just you use the recipe blindly and you'll get something useful. And then you plug those values back in and you get the dual problem. And the first two, three times that you do this, it'll take some time. Afterwards, it'll become kind of second nature. Okay. So now, what properties do we have? Well, it ignores the typical instances with small error. And obviously, you cannot both exceed the value, as in having, having something that's too large and having something that's too small. It's impossible to get things wrong on both sides. So obviously, therefore, only one of those variables here, alpha i, alpha i star, is going to be active. and well, it's robust with respect to outliers, and we'll look at some loss functions in a moment. So let's look at an example. So here's you know, some data, and you basically see the upper and the lower boundary here. It's a zinc function, and then here's the regression estimate. I think that's something that I actually did in my master's thesis, so it's like 15 years ago. And after that, everybody decided to also do regression on zinc functions just because I had done that. So when you the first time do experiments, make sure you pick a better example. Otherwise, everybody else will basically pick the same silly examples as you did. Okay, 
So same thing here. And as you basically increase the, the insensitivity, well, you can see that you know, the solution now becomes simpler and simpler, which is exactly what you want. And if you then squint, you can see where the support vectors sit. They sit exactly you know, at the points where things are constrained. So this was kind of useful because this is like spline fitting, except that you don't really need all the basis functions. Here's another loss function. And this one's actually really useful. So if you're doing large scale regression and you don't use GPs, as in Gaussian processes, this one's very much recommended. It's basically quadratic here in this region, and then it's linear on the outside. So this actually corresponds to a trimmed mean estimator. Does everybody know what a trimmed mean estimator is? OK, good. So the trimmed mean estimator is one of the earliest applications of statistics that are documented from the Middle Ages. Um, and here's how the. OK, I'll, I'll describe the, the algorithm. The algorithm was invented to come up with a more or less reasonable idea of how long one foot was. Okay, and if you're in some village somewhere and you don't really have a good calibrated measurement, well, how do you figure out how long one foot is? Okay. The algorithm was pick the first 12 men who leave church. Because everybody had to go to church, so everybody well, OK, so you tell them to step aside. You send the two men with the shortest feet home. You send the two men with the longest feet home. You tell the remaining eight to line up in a row. OK, so you have one foot, another one. OK, I'm really bad at drawing feet. I guess you get the idea. You divide it by eight, which is something you can easily do. That's why they didn't take 10, but eight. <coughs> that length, and that gives you an idea for how long one foot shall be. Now, why did they send the two guys with the shortest feet home? Well, it was after all the Middle Ages, and people sometimes had crippled feet, so it was not unlikely that you had those outliers. Well, the guys with the longest feet, well, I don't know whether they should have sent them home, but the point is basically what this does is it's robust against situations where you just happen to have a lot of really crappy data. Now, how does this relate to who was robust loss, right? This sounds a little bit crazy. Well, effectively, <coughs> if you're minimizing with regard to this loss function, and you can check that, so it's quadratic here and linear out there, if you're minimizing essentially yi minus x, and here we have this loss function, Hooper, then the solution thereof will be exactly, you take all the points which lie inside here, and you take the average. Because if you minimize squared loss, you get exactly the average. And you will also see that the number of points on either side of those branches will be equal. So their gradient contributions here cancel each other out. So the effect of that is you're throwing the smallest and the largest guys away, and you take the average of anything that's in between, <coughs> which is exactly how in the Middle Ages they computed the length of the feet, of a foot. Except that, of course, they didn't know about robust statistics, except intuitively they implemented an algorithm that did this. So if you're doing regression, this is not a bad idea. Any questions? Today is very quiet. I know it's snowy outside and cold. And anyway, okay, let's look at something fun: novelty detection. So, what's the basic idea? You have some observations drawn from some distribution, like, for instance, network usage patterns handwritten digits, alarm sensors, factory status, your car alarm, right? And what you want to do is you want to detect the unusual events. 
Or for instance, maybe you have a database and you want to find the guys that are possibly wrong there. Or maybe you actually want to find the more typical observations. So, you know, in network intrusion detection, well, sure, you can basically go and hire people and whenever a new attack comes, you code up a detector for that attack and that's good because then you'll know, okay, it's attack number 20. Now, it's not so good if <coughs> there's a new attack because obviously a new attack has exactly the property that it's quite unlike anything that you've seen before. So you want to find out whenever your network is doing that, quite unlike anything that you've seen before, which sounds like a super vague description, right? Or you want to find out whether somebody maybe is downloading a lot of stuff that they shouldn't be downloading, basically whenever something is going wrong. And since things can go wrong in a lot more ways than we can think about it, wouldn't it be nice if we had a device that at least picked it up if something went wrong? <coughs> Another situation is, for instance, jet failure engine detection, or if you have an advertising system and you want to detect whether it's going wrong, right? So jet engines tend to be really expensive, so blowing them up just for the purpose of finding out you know, how they could blow up is expensive. <laughs> you might do that once or tw twice for the FAA, but other than that, you tend to avoid it. And, but on the other hand, you get so much really typical usage data out of them. Now, they run for ages. I mean, you, fingers crossed planes usually don't crash, and so we have a lot of typical usage data. Couldn't we find out from that a reasonable engine profile such that we know if it's outside the parameters? Or database cl cleaning. So sometimes people just mistype, mislabel things, or for instance, I mean, you might have situations where, so usually when I'm forced to sign up somewhere in a somewhere and it asks me for where I'm from and when I'm born, I'm born on the 1st of January 1900 in Afghanistan usually. Uh, and you want to detect such cases, right? <clears throat> um, you might want to do fraud detection, so for credit card transactions and so on, unusual patterns. Or another thing that would actually be really cool as a project for somebody who's more engineering minded, well, you know, you have a self-calibrating car alarm. Well, what's more annoying than a car alarm, it's, it's a car alarm that's fully calibrated that you know, just keeps on going off whenever a truck drives past. But on the other hand, if, it's, if it doesn't go off when somebody breaks into your car, it's not a useful car alarm. So wouldn't you want to have something that actually adjusts itself fairly automatically to the environment? So here's the idea. So first of all, well, novel data is the one that we don't really see very frequently. It actually has to lie in the low density regions. Yeah. So, well, the natural thing would be, well, we could just go and estimate the density, right? We know how to do that. We did parse the windows before. And then we just go and, you know, we threshold the density. So we just sort according to P hat of X. Maybe we use, you know, some leave one out estimation to adjust the kernel width. And we just sort and we pick the smallest guys and well, let's see what happens. So if you just look at the rank, I mean, you get something fairly reasonable. And so here's typical data. Okay, looks fairly typical in terms of, you know, bad handwriting. This guy here isn't so great. But it's not too bad. And this is not specifically tuned for images, it's just something. You will probably all agree that this looks a lot worse than that. So, mission accomplished, right? You know, we detected some horrible digits and as a matter of fact, I mean, they are poorly written and you have some segmentation errors. So if you look at this guy here, this apparently actually is labeled, I think, as five. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's kind of weird. Um, but actually, we are kind of overdoing it. So, well, why are we overdoing it? Right. So, first of all, density estimation tries to be really good wherever we have high density regions. Well, we don't care about the high density regions. Here we care about the low density regions. The other thing is the actual value of the density estimate is completely irrelevant. 
you know, whether that actual value is 10 or 20 or 0.1, doesn't matter. So we don't really care about this being a proper density, it could as well be uncalibrated. And the other thing is, quite often we only care about a certain fraction of observations. So for instance, you know, if you have an intrusion detection system and you have one poor system in that has to handle all of this, then you don't want to send him more than 10 alerts a day, because he'll just get mad at you. At least unless something really bad goes there. It goes badly wrong. So, therefore, you want to fix a certain rate. Now, how can you do that? Well, the thing is, you actually only care about the label set, and you can throw away the normalization. And let me step ahead a little bit and give you a preview on exponential families, but don't really worry too much about it. We'll get back to this in a lot more detail later. But it just so happens to be a more natural way of introducing single class SVM than the way how we came up with it. The way how we came up with it is we were basically just joking around and somebody said, well, you know, what would single class SVM be? And then we thought about it and realized that maybe it wasn't such an idiotic question. So we came up with a name first and then we understood what the algorithm does. So it's one of those bizarre situations. So have coffee, you get ideas. Um, anyway, so here's what you have in an exponential family model. You basically have e to some inner product between far x and theta <coughs> minus the normalization. This one tends to be hard and messy and expensive to compute, but a convex function. And while well, this is just, you know, some inner product. So I think Banavash already discussed a few examples thereof. So you already saw Gaussians, you saw Masson, you saw a distribution of a several random variables. They're all members of the exponential family. You can just have any phi of x, except that for any phi of x, usually computing g is a complete nightmare. Um, but if we, you know, perform map estimation, then, you know, here's the optimization problem. Basically, this is the negative log likelihood, and this is something like a prior. So remember, this is, looks very similar to the W squared that we have before, and that's not a coincidence. But let's just look at it in pictures, right? So what we really care about are the low density regions, these guys here. We don't really care about what's above that red line. And we actually wouldn't also care about, well, anything, any rescaling. So, any questions so far? So, one way of getting rid of both is to say, well, actually, rather than the log likelihood, we only care about the log likelihood relative to a reference log likelihood. So I'm taking the ratio between p of x i and theta, and e to some rho minus g of theta, which is you know some other reference likelihood. And whenever that ratio is less than one, then I'll care about it. That's, these are basically novel observations. Whenever it's you know larger than one, then this will all become zero. So I don't care. Okay. Now if you Look at the math, what you get is basically this expression here. And of course, it's carefully doctored such that you get exactly that nice optimization problem. So what this is now is basically the maximum of you know, some threshold minus the inner product between far x i and theta. So whenever you're above that threshold, well, we don't really care about how very typical the observations are. If you're below that threshold, you at least want to get a decent fit. And the advantage is that now we've just switched from a not very nice convex problem to a rather simple quadratic program. Now, if that all looks super confusing to you, here's a geometric explanation of the same thing. But sometimes when you look at the geometry first, you think, well, why on earth would that be an interesting problem? So basically, the idea is I want to find a hyperplane that separates all the data from the origin as far as possible. So I want to push that plane out. Right. That's essentially 
the idea. Now, separating as far as possible means basically I minimize one half w squared under the constraint that w the xi is greater or equal than one. And if I have slack variables, I get this. So this looks awfully similar to SVMs, which is exactly why we came up with, with that algorithm after thinking about the name. And then, you know, you solve, look at the optimization problem, you look at the optimality conditions, so it's exactly the same thing as what we saw before. And you get an optimization problem that also looks almost the same as before, so you can easily kernelize it, right? We have the familiar box constraints on the alphas. The only thing is that there are now no labels. So here's another geometric way of looking at it. So you could think of, you know, I want to find the minimum enclosing ball for the data. Now, if my data is all mapped onto, onto the surface of a sphere, which is exactly the case, for instance, for a Gaussian RBF, then finding the hyperplane that pushes as far away as possible and finding the minimum enclosing ball are the same thing. You can see that immediately because if I slice a ball with a hyperplane, well, you know, I'll get, you know, if you look at it, you basically get, you know, as, as, a, as a cut surface, you get another. Yeah, ball or circle or whatever you might put it. So this will automatically give you the minimum enclosing ball. So these two problems are actually identical, as are the equivalent in the case of Gaussian RBFs. So the only thing that we now haven't solved yet is the adaptive threshold. And basically the issue was that you know, depending on, you know, how we actually set that up a constraint, we get a different number of points. So can't we just say, well, on average, I want to have like 5% of all observations to be considered novel, and the rest is typical. So in that case, well, you just say, well, now that threshold equals rho. Okay, so then that threshold be adaptive. So now if I just change that, what I'm doing is I'm basically changing that position of that hyperplane, right? And so here's how you do it. You basically have as the primal optimization problem now one, where the threshold itself is variable. By the way, if, if you have any questions, uh, you should ask. Everybody's getting very silent right now. Now think of all those points here. Here we have the hyperplane, here's W, here's a new point. And so what you have, W dot X is greater or equal than rho minus psi i. So rho, that's a psi. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so if I make rho larger, well, that just pushes out the threshold, right? If I make rho smaller, it decreases it, so fewer points will violate the margin. And so therefore, well, what I want to do is, on one hand, I want to have a really large rho. I achieve this by putting minus m times nu times rho, and Bear with me about the meaning of those coefficients m and nu. Um, and that'll basically make rho large, want to make rho large. At the same time, whenever I make rho large, well, the psi i's for the points that actually violate the, you know, that constraint, those will increase. So they will want to make rho small. And so what happens is that now this m times nu times m times nu trades off the extent to which I want to make rho larger and the extent to what, which I want to, you know, make the size small. So the first thing to do is to look at the dual problem and there you already see something interesting happening, right? So you basically have the standard quadratic program again. Now without any linear term you have a homogen homogeneous quadratic part and the constraint that the alpha i's are between 0 and 1. 
and you have also the condition sum over alpha i equals nu times n. Now that's quite interesting, right? Because what this means is, well actually, can somebody tell me what this means in terms of the number of alpha i's that have to be non-zero? Well, we know that the alpha i's are all non-negative, and we know that they're bounded by one. So how many alpha i's do I need at least to satisfy that rate constraint? Any suggestions? One? Who bits more? B times yeah, nu times m. Yeah. Because I need at least nu times m alphas that will ensure that basically I can actually satisfy this, this condition. I mean, I could have all the alpha i's being non zero, but at least I need nu times m. Well, and yeah, it's actually the next largest integer if you want to be pedantic. So, what, what happens is that, you know, if, in terms of points that sit here and points that sit there, that number, let's just call this thing here m minus, let's call this thing, these guys here m zero, and let's call them here m m plus, we know that m0 plus m minus has to be greater or equal than nu times m. We also know that these m pluses here have to be less than 1 minus nu times m, right? Because otherwise these cannot really make up for everything. So we know that m0 plus m minus is, well actually also, well, m0 is less equal than 1 minus nu. So in other words, it really boils down to those points on the boundary because their value can truly be anywhere between 0 and 1. You can also see the solution of that problem by just looking at the variational argument of the primal problem directly. Basically, you just change rho by a little delta, and you check what happens to all the size at the optimal solution, and things go around exactly this way. So we are going to go through the proof probably in more detail um, next Wednesday, and then we'll also see that this actually gives a lot better pro uh, solutions for OCR. If you have any questions so far, let me know. But I mean, you can see that this gives a lot uglier digits than before. Same data set finds a lot uglier things. And no, it's not OK to use as a project this algorithm and use it on hot or not. Don't do that. Um, can you please press the stop button?